Well, it may now be legal, but many people who want to grow marijuana and sell it commercially say government red tape is making it nearly impossible to go into business. CTV's Petty Daflos with that story. Growing legal pot just got a lot more complicated. Health Canada is now demanding companies build out their entire facility to prove they're serious before they'll even look at the paperwork to let them grow anything inside. Uh, it was quite a surprise to industry. Entrepreneur Berinda Rossotti runs programs to help small-time pot producers get in the legal game. You know, it can be interpreted as the government saying, you know, we're not uh, supportive of craft growers. Um, that can be seen because they've had 200 applications. They've put one through the process. More than 100 people in the cannabis industry, many of them aspiring micro producers, went to this Health Canada info and consultation session in downtown Vancouver and many weren't happy. Uh, well, the consultation process uh, I've personally found to be disingenuous. CTV News tried to see the consultation process for ourselves, but were denied. So even though there are Health Canada officials able to answer our questions on the other side of that door, instead they referred our request for comment to their public relations department in Ottawa. Their words and actions are, are simply not meeting policies or being created that completely contradict Health Canada's claims that they want to steward uh, uh, you know, the existing growers in the system. This longtime cannabis lawyer sees the same problem. I'm basically hearing that there's a bit of miscommunication between what the government would really like to do and what Health Canada has been doing. And so hopefully that will get ironed out. Until that happens, if it does, craft cannabis will be left to unlicensed sales. There seems to be no shortage of interest whether it's got a Health Canada seal of approval or not. Penny Daflos, CTV News, Vancouver. Uh, we've, we've got obviously a level of interest a little higher than the, the room that we planned for, but uh, yeah. hopefully this, uh, this uh, can work in terms of the sound quality. I think you can all see the screen back there. We may kind of alternate sitting and, and uh, sitting and standing over the course of the afternoon. Um, and I know when I, I hear a lot when I'm out talking with people, um, you know, I hear comments that cannabis is a low risk product. Um, I've been a regulator for a long time and I've seen lots of circumstances of low risk products that hurt people. Um, and they don't usually hurt people sometimes because of the product themselves, but when you take that product and you manufacture it, um, you put it through some form of processing, you put it into packaging, all of those things um, provide an opportunity for something to become contaminated, um, for something to create a harm into the system. And so those are, those are the, the rules are the things that kind of give us comfort. When it comes to activities with cannabis, the first question you need to ask is, am I permitted to do this under the Cannabis Act or the Cannabis Regs? Whereas in a lot of other businesses, you would just go off and do something and only by exception would there be some kind of a, a prohibition or a rule that might say that you can't. So activities around cannabis are very strictly regulated and you need to think about that first around what it is you're proposing to do with the plant, with the cannabis products. So when you do get a license, it comes with a certain set of expectations uh, from, from consumers, from the provincial and territorial uh, wholesaler buyers that certain standards have been met. So the, the, the stuff that we have around uh, good production practices being the most notable piece of that. So the quality of the product, the accuracy of your label, and when you don't meet those expectations, it reflects not just on the business, um, but it, it could result in, in harm if someone's reading, is consuming a product where the label doesn't tell them uh, what they should expect in terms of you know, potency, uh, and uh, uh, that's not where any of us want to be. What kind of harm? <laughs> uh, when people consume a product that is stronger than they don't want to, then that's... It's tempered. Sure. Okay, but that, that seems also true of coffee Arbitrary. beans. Arbitrary. But we don't need to arrest anyone mm -hmm. over coffee beans. Well, we're not talking about arresting someone, we're talking about putting Yeah, yeah, products. we are talking about yeah. all these regulations that. involve if you don't comply with them, you might get arrested. Do you know that? Are you aware of that? So, uh, what we're talking about is for those who are seeking to come into the regulated market, <coughs> that Meeting the expectations, meeting the rules, uh, it takes some work on, on your behalf. And those rules are there to try and make sure the public health and safety objectives that we talked about on the previous slide are met. Within a regulated space, um, when, when something goes wrong, it's not a criminal offense, generally speaking. It's not regulatory non-compliance, and it means that we'll come in and we'll see you, and we might have to do a recall, and we might have to 
review your standard operating procedures, but for those who are operating in the regulated space, uh, there, there's, there's systems in place to try and find issues like a labeling concern and address those and make sure they don't happen again. So it's a, it's a way of working through problems in the regulated sector without necessarily getting into any, any aspect of criminal law. Are you aware that the harms have been overblown to justify a cartel? Are you self, do you have that much self-awareness? So, so I think what we've tried to do today is set up a session for those who are interested in coming into the regulated space mm -hmm. to find out about uh, what that application process is like, what it takes uh, to make it through it, and what it's like to operate within the regulated space. So do you that's think why the we're regulations good. are justified yourself. Do you think so, so sir, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not here today to debate whether the Cannabis Act is or is not a good piece of legislation. We're here to try and provide information for those who want to apply uh, under the Act and the regs to participate in the sector as it has been put in place. If it's on, if you cannot defend, do you expect anyone to comply? This is this is wasting our time. Yeah, yeah why don't you get lost, yeah. buddy? Yeah. Sorry, so there's a question and answer there. And later, there, are, there are people in jail. I don't, want to, I don't want to separate this, like I want to paraphrase your question. But I think his concern is that you act outside the regulation, you face criminal prosecution. It's wasting our time. It's wasting it's our time. time. They're going to explain it anyway unless you've got to keep it in If you're outside the regulated industry, you face a criminal prosecution, you face uh, criminal prosecution, right? So the idea is to get everybody compliant so they don't have to deal with that. So wouldn't the easiest form of regulation be to get everybody in and then just to fix the paperwork as you go? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, respect to where the question is coming from, but that, that's not why, what we came here to do. And I think most folks here in the room uh, aren't, aren't here to debate the merits of the Cannabis Act and, and the overall regulatory approach. Um, if, if you would like to, I'd be happy to have a, a chat with you in the hall, and Joanne can continue with the presentation uh, for the, the rest of the audience. Will you do that on camera? No, I'm not here to do that. Well, then I'm asking you all my questions while the camera's rolling so we get your answers. Hey, sir, uh, there's uh, 75, 80 people here to hear about the licensing process, and we'd like to move on with the content. This is the only accountability I get, and I've been working at this for 25 years, and there are hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. You're wasting our time. You're wasting, please go. You think you're going to get in? Please go. Do you have the millions necessary to give you? Okay. You don't have, you don't have a, a clue what you're talking about. Not a clue. He's wasting our time. If you lie about the harm, can you, you, can you not you have some them? security get him out of here? This is wasting oh, our time. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Thanks for your patience. Uh, you know, we know that people come to this with different views and different experiences and different lived experiences. My goal here today is not to minimize those in any way, um, but the reason that we do a QA and a session is that so everybody can have the opportunity to ask their questions, raise their concerns. So that's my goal today. Um, you know, I do respect that people have other opinions and as I go and talk to stakeholders, I hear those as well. Um, the last thing that uh, we'll kind of touch on within our list is just to say that um, this is not a space where people can cut corners. So when you fail at the moment, the system fails. And whether that's fair or it's not fair um, is open for debate. But the reality is that this was a major policy shift for the government. When they moved to legalize cannabis uh, in October of 20, um, uh, 2018, that was a major policy shift, and we are not a year into it. Um, and there will be learnings over the coming months and the coming years. Um, there will eventually be a review of the program, and those experiences will feed into that. And whether we need to change course along the way and make some fine-tune some things and make some adjustments, those are things we will consider. But at the moment, we find we're still in a place where people have very strong views, and, and you're hearing that a little bit today. Um, people have strong views. Some people feel very strongly in one direction, but I still go out and talk to people that feel very strongly about that cannabis should be legalized. And that's not the debate that I have, but the reality of it is that the consequence of that is that when something happens in the system, it to some extent reflects on everybody as an applicant and a license holder. And so that's why I say, to some extent, everybody's kind of, uh, of looking at us. So with that, we'll kind of end the, uh, 
and the humor for the presentation <laughs> are our bad form of humor. Um, and we'll just move along with, uh, with the deck. Sorry, can everybody hear okay? I, just, I know there's a conversation still happening at the back. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, so I think we've kind of covered on this. There are a few slides that I'll just kind of touch on lightly. Uh, no surprise, the Cannabis Act and the regulations provide a framework for legal access. Look, psychosis rates haven't increased over the last 25, 30 years. IQs haven't dipped. It doesn't make kids stupid or crazy. If you look at impairment levels, it's about 100 times less than the legal levels for alcohol impairment. It's a soft drug. It's like the coffee that you're serving in that room. Nobody got busted for coffee beans this year, or last year, or the year before. Organic fair trade coffee bean regulations could replace these regulations, and then none of these people would get hurt by their livelihoods being destroyed so that Trudeau's cartel can bask in its opulence and, and their captive market that they lobbied for. It is genocide of the medically autonomous and the herbally autonomous to deny them an in to legalization. And it's everybody's duty to resist genocide in every nonviolent way they can, including breaking up your meetings and calling you on your lies about cannabis being harmful. There is no harm. People don't die of cannabis. More people have died of an overdose of caffeine in one year than all the deaths throughout history of cannabis. Hi, sorry, do you mind if I interrupt here? I just are you part of the conference here? We just have a private well, conference going on. Yeah, I know you. To, it was open to public consultation. Right? Like I think, I'm, I think open I've, to I've been, I've been, been invited a, to applicants. I've been a. Uh, I could have been an applicant, but the the city of Vancouver charged me thirty five thousand dollars a year licensing for my dispensary, so I had to close it due to discrimination. Still, like I don't want to, I don't want to paraphrase you, Dave, but I think his concern is just that the regulations could be set up in a way that would be very inclusive to get people in, and then you could use the regulatory framework to uh, circumvent the unnecessary need for criminal justice, which has not happened. There's still people being arrested. Like so, first step, you could just say, "Come on in." With step number one, sure. and then you can work on every other piece. I don't want to paraphrase you, Dave, but it seems like that would be a solution. Why are you being as exclusive as possible when you could be being as inclusive as possible? So the, the whole point of the meeting and these sessions that we've been doing is we've put in place um, a special license, this micro license, to try and create a pathway for people to join uh, the legal market for the Cannabis Act. I'm hearing from the people in that room, or some of them, that you've been now taking that away? No, that's exactly why we're here, to explain how it works, what it takes. What but you have to have all your the infrastructure set up and you can't get the inf infrastructure unless you have the license you can't get the license you have the infrastructure you so created every, a catch-22 I mean, well sorry the catch-22 every other regulated business you apply for your license once you're ready to go so if you if you know to you know to draw but the you've analogy created so, artificial need for infrastructure that's beyond the capacity well, of most people to be able that, to afford that's that's your view. Uh, oh. we've, we've created. Oh, is that the best you can do from one human to another? That's your view. You won't talk about the veracity of that view, your own personal perspective. Do you agree or disagree, or are you just neutral bureaucrat who kind of facilitates the genocide of the herbally autonomous without taking a personal view of it? So, so two things. Legislation and regulations have gone through. They've followed the process that we follow uh, as a country to put legislation in place. It's in place. So we're here to talk about how people operate within. What's my the, role the other thing as an activist is, who, the other thing who, who studied is, the task force? Sure, the other thing I would say is, for those who are growing, for their personal medical need, we have a whole separate program that's been around. He's talking about years. people who've been so feeding their need, families on this for well, that's, decades, for that's generations. Different. Well, no, that's what you're talking about in there. Talking about the income. Micro licenses. People allowed to make a living off cannabis. They're co evolutionary plant partners. I'm just trying to understand. You talked about what is medical my and genocide. And yeah, well, autonomous. if, okay, so if you treat cannabis, which is a soft drug, like a hard drug, and get people to accept these arbitrary rules that are based on lies, Reefer Madness 2.0, whether you acknowledge it exists or not, it does exist. 
and, and my role as pot activist, to represent my people, is to challenge you. And, and when you uh, try to lay this stigma down that, oh, cannabis causes so much harm, you should stick to the regs so you don't harm people. Well, what was so the, quality the overdose, stuff, the overuse, quality, so, but, but listen, the, deaths? The quality for the last control system that we have is basically the same one that exists for food, exists no. for medical devices, no. exists for... How many, yeah. what's the plant limit on coffee bean trees? There's no plant limit Exactly. For, there's no there's, plant limit for someone who gets a cannabis license. There is a plant limit for home growth. Sure there is, because that's based on medical What's the needs. plant limit for home growth of coffee beans, coffee trees? None. You're not taking Zero. coffee for medical reasons. It's a stimulant. Cannabis is a soft okay. drug. Coffee is a soft drug. Okay? okay? So the, the equal regulatory necessity. to make cannabis products you, to sell to other people. You're right? selling a lie. That cannabis requires all this tight regulations to save the kids from being stupid and crazy. That's your role, and my role is so to expose you. The quality control of any product that gets marketed is very similar. If you want to open a butcher shop, you're going to be subject to regulation on sanitation. I would not be opposed control. to fair trade organic coffee right. bean rules being superimposed on cannabis. That's not what is happening here. Teens can still get arrested. For pot, how many teens are arrested for possession of coffee beans last year? None, zero. No people can get, oh, that's all the reg regulations you need to keep people safe from bad cannabis, organic, fair trade, coffee bean regs. Anything else is just Trudeau's friends trying to get a captive market so they can make money off other people's misery and you're facilitating it. So the That's whole your job. Here, we've set up these micro licenses to try and broaden the base of supply. But you made it impossible with the Catch-22 that you think, as long as I say, well, that's your view. You're off the hook. No, you're the seller of the Catch-22. You, sir, are here to betray all the farmers and gardeners of the world to set up this model so the rest of the countries can point to Canada and say, well, that's a progressive country, and use the same model to make it for rich people only to grow and sell cannabis. That's your job. Don't you have any remorse? Can you look at yourself at night and say, ah, I'm here doing good things on planet Earth? Or do you sometimes get a little feeling inside you that maybe you're doing something wrong? No, nothing? Not a human, just a bureaucrat. It's like the Eichmann of Canada. Facilitating a different kind of genocide, not so much May no, I borrow no killing. You? Sure. You promised me five minutes. No I killing. Have my suitcases and I'm going to leave. Okay. Just hey, head up. Verinder. Who are you? Verinder. What do you do? Nice to meet you. I'm Niche Canada. What is that? Nonprofit. Just trying to educate the rest of Canada on legalization. Okay. Okay. Nice to meet. But I'm going to steal him now if it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, not getting anything out of him. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Oh, I bet. You haven't heard the last of me, buddy. So I think probably why everybody's here today is partly to hear from us a little bit about the announcements that we made last week and some of the thinking behind those and what the implications of that will be for anybody who is an applicant within the process. Uh, so we did announce changes to our licensing process last week. Um, the reason that we uh, took that under consideration and, and did uh, proceed with, with the changes um, we were hearing a lot of feedback from both internally. We did some. We did a little bit of a look at kind of what was in our queue, what thing, what submissions had we reviewed, and what was the what was the kind of end result of those decisions. So we did. Um, we we spent quite a bit of time looking at you know the number of submissions that we were receiving in uh, on a monthly basis. We obviously had a fairly long queue of some of the standard applications and also looking at our capacity kind of month over month, how many decisions could we make based on our processing time for applications. We also looked at just over the past number of years of submissions that we had actually looked at, how many of them came into us with a final evidence package um, in play, and we're in a place where they were actually able to be a, a fully operational business. And what we found with that is about 70% of the applications that we reviewed over the last couple of years did not ever, have not come back into us with a final evidence package. And some of those date um, almost to three years ago. And so we've gone through that full process of doing a detailed review of their submission, but they have not gone ahead to build a facility and come back with that evidence package. So obviously there was a concern from our perspective about the amount of time and effort we were putting into submissions that were not really ready to be operational as a business. 
And the downstream consequence of that is that if you are a new applicant coming in or you were an applicant that did have a business that was operational and ready to go, um, in some cases you could have been waiting 18 months to two years um, for us even to pick up your submission and, and have a look at it. I've been involved in this uh, area going back to uh, 1972. And uh, when the number of people busted for cannabis went from a few hundred to 10,000, and then uh, by 78 it was 50,000, uh, I incorporated the BC Compassion Club Society in 97, which was over 20 years ago. And when all of this started, uh, we had personal producers, which we still have now under Part 14 of the Cannabis Act, and designated growers. And we were involved in quite a bit of litigation trying to get Health Canada, under a different government regime at the time, to allow uh, designated growers to grow for more than one, uh, to allow people to have more than four licenses in one place, or three licenses, I think it was originally, or two, anyway. The courts always agreed that these limitations were unreasonable. They were uh, bearing in mind that for medical patients, uh, you're under an obligation to provide reasonable access to their medicine to avoid the violation of their constitutional rights. That doesn't exist in the rec market. Mm -hmm. But we don't have you doing anything for the medical market and the medical patients in relation to their reasonable access other than by growing for themselves, have somebody grow for them, or getting it in the mail from an existing LP, which is what the court found to be not working properly in the Allard case. So my concern is, given the history, and I've had to read all the royal commissions, uh, read all the investigations from you know, everybody over the last many, many years, and, and, and listen to experts in court confirm there's no lethal dose. Uh, and I haven't seen, other than a few young people eating too many cookies at a 420, or the odd person who maybe has schizophrenia in their family who as a psychotic episode, uh, you know, where are the health and safety problems that you are so concerned about? I know that they exist for alcohol, tobacco, many other things, but why can't we simply have designated growers who have their product tested? Why do we need all this other stuff? Why can't we just continue with the designated grower? Surely the bottom line is, it's a safe product. Nothing more. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 I have a few more, but I'll sit down. Yes, but we're going we're to try to do one at a time. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously that was not so much a question as a rhetorical question, but, but uh, I, I guess all I would say along those lines is, um, the Cannabis Act, the Cannabis Regs are six months old. They, they represent a sea change in the approach to cannabis relative to Canada, relative to most jurisdictions uh, around the world. Um, it, it does take a certain view of the product, and we have tried to provide through the micro license, through uh, other provisions that we put into the Cannabis Act and Regs, path for people who participated in the gray market, the black market, to come in under this regulated scheme. I mean, a, a view that it's still too heavily regulated, I understand probably most people in this room would, would take that perspective, um, but why we're here and why we've created this class of license and this, this kind of path is to try and provide a way for, to meet in the middle with, with something that is proportionate and, and goes ahead. Um, and I guess that's all I can say. The, the only other thing I would say is, we have done things over the years to try and ratchet down slowly the level of regulation we do within the commercial space. So the, you know, the, the easiest example is the vault, right? You, you, know, you can still buy used vaults on eBay right now because we used to require them and at a certain point we said, you know what, that isn't proportionate to the risk. Um, people are, you know, business people want to protect their inventory as much as anybody else does. They'll take reasonable measures to protect their inventory. So we kind of have a few specific requirements around storage of finished product, but it's not what it once was. We've done things like um, within our licensing process, 
Uh, Joanne talked about how we used to inspect. You know, before you could have a plant in the ground, you would have been inspected once. Before you could uh, sell into industry, you would have been inspected probably twice. We've moved away from that. We've moved to a model where once you're licensed, you can start a business. You can sell within the industry, and the only time we're going to insist on an inspection is when you're going to sell directly to, to patients or directly to the province without having to go through someone who's, who's already got a full processing license. So I know that won't fully address the, the, the medical <coughs> access point that you raised. All that to say, though, that uh, we do continue to look and reassess our framework on a regular basis, either you know within the rules and how we administer them, and then obviously the Cannabis Act is set up for a uh, three-year review, two and a half years from now, because uh, that's built into the legislation, uh, and, and we can relook at where we're at, uh, at at that point. Not before. Uh, I, I could hardly see with, you know, we're, we've already got a huge set of regulations coming to enable uh, the, uh, the, the, the new classes of products in the fall. Uh, there'll be a new government, so I think, you know, two and a half years from now is, uh, will come at us really, really quickly. Yeah, but I have to add, those new regulations have such low or THC limits in terms of edibles and extracts, mm -hmm. that you've got all of these medical patients mm -hmm. who've been entitled to possess and use that mm -hmm. in different forms since Smith, and uh, many of them are disabled and unable to make those products yeah. for themselves. And so, you know, w we need to have you address having mm -hmm. stronger products for medical patients mm -hmm. instead of these very low ones that are just going to promote continuation of the underground. The, the only thing I'll say to that is the, uh, the proposed regulations that, that yes, the, the 10 milligram limit is there for edible products, but for concentrates, uh, there is no, there is, well, it's a, it's a much higher, a much higher uh, 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 limit in a package, so that's what's going to be most fun. Yep. Um, I'd just like to pay my respects to John Conroy and to what he's done for this industry, so thank you very much for your questions. Surely, a person who's a designated gr grower, if they can't uh, apply to grow for more than two, could apply to become a micro producer with a license to sell and the sub license to sell for medical purposes, and there, that in that way, expand the number of patients that they're growing for. I mean. They may have to then stop the DG because it's merged into the micro. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, and then that, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's exactly what kind of contemplated. Is that you could scale up and then sell for dozens or hundreds of patients under a micro. It would be a vertically integrated micro cultivator process with medical sales. The only, the only hook I would say is that the federal medical sales is still only by, uh, by some kind of courier mail, whatever, it's not retail, so. Um, was there not something to do with online? Mm -hmm. yeah. so you, it, it, online is another yeah. word. Yeah, yeah, but it can be something simpler too. It can be, you know, by phone, uh, a That's telephone order that then gets delivered. The only, there's no retail, so I just want to emphasize that here. Although a person could have a bank of computers in their retail store, and you could order online and go across and pick it up from the wicket, couldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, John. Wait a minute, one question. Uh, before clarifying that one, did you know that in BC, the Agricultural Land Commission, since last August, requires you to grow in soil? And you can't grow, in a, unless you had a building that was there before August, I think it was of last year. Does that affect your, your GPP thing? I know you can grow outside now. Uh, so does it matter if you're growing inside a building in soil as far as these building requirements? I'm going to pass it over because we, we've been looking at outdoor grow uh, licenses, which kind of goes to your question. And there's been, at least some of them, I think, have been uh, kind of hooped. Uh, mm -hmm. Hoop, hoop greenhouses, temporary greenhouses, but uh, I'll pass it over. Yeah, so I can touch on it a little bit, and Jackie can kind of jump on it as well. Um, so generally, we consider in, indoor grow is kind of here within a building, so it's, it's typically a permanent structure with, with walls, something that is in place. Um, with an indoor grow application, you're either sort of truly growing outside. Um, we have seen some applications where you're growing from kind of a temporary structure, which is kind of like a we call it a hoop house, but you are growing in the ground, um, and and those are subject to the requirements for uh, for outdoor grow. Well, that's yeah, indoor. No, no, that's outdoor. Tem temporary structure. Mm -hmm.